good to see you again as we come together to worship the Lord. Turn with me in your Bibles to the 16th chapter of Genesis, starting in verse 1. Sixteenth chapter of Genesis. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hangar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said, so after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarah's wife took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she, drew, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to shore. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a moment of silent prayer. When Bonnie and I were expecting our first child, we bought a book of names for babies. We were looking for names for a boy and, or a girl. And there are some interesting names in the Bible, like Obadiah, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Jeze Jezebel. But we decided on a more traditional name, Carissa. Now at Christmas, we heard about a lady whose name is Merry Christmas. And there's a fellow pastor whose last name is Beach. And when he and his wife had their first child, they got suggestions for the first name like Myrtle Beach, Sandy Beach, Sully Beach, and so on. Now, back in the days of the Canaanites, 2,000 years before Christ, names meant a whole lot more than they do today. People paid a lot of attention to the names of pagan gods, and they were gods and goddesses for about everything. Now, this morning, we are going to look at the name that begins with the prefix E-L. It's a generic term for God and was commonly used in connection with many of the pagan gods. It was just not a, a Hebrew name for God. The name E-L refers to awesome power that instills within humankind a sense of mystery and dread of reverence. There is nothing personal about the name El in itself. However, when it's used with other terms, it reveals to us a variety of dimensions about the, the character of God. You see, the name implies a, a radical shift in our view of God. It goes far beyond describing him as one who is majestic, distant, and powerful. And, and with this name of El Rolai, we see God as extremely personal in our lives. 
So, so who first gave God this new name? Or was this young, frightened, lowly servant girl? Her story is found in Genesis 16 that we've read. Her name is Hagar. Now let's look at the background of our text. God gave Abram a promise. He was going to be the father of many nations, and his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Ten years after that, God made the promise. After his promise, Abraham was 85 years old and still childless. And the chances of him becoming a father was pretty slim. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not want a baby at 85 years old. I do not. I mean, it would cry, it would wake me up, and I would have to roll over from a comfortable position and get Bonnie out of bed so she could take care of the baby. Sarah, Abraham's wife, made what seemed to be a shocking suggestion. He would sleep with Hagar, her slave girl, and in order that they would have a child. Now today, this would not be considered an okay solution. But in those days, it was common practice. There was even a legal system that spelled out how this was to be done. The servant would give birth to the child, but it would be the legally the child of the father and his wife, and the servant had absolutely no rights as the mother. Hagar became pregnant. She was feeling superior to Sarah. She had provided for Abraham what Sarah could not. And though the whole thing was Sarah's idea, Sarah was filled with with jealousy, and she did not like the results of her plan, and she cried to her husband, It's your fault! (laughs) Now I can stop and say a few things here, but it's probably better I just go on. Now, being the leader that he was, you know, the head of the household, uh, Abraham just decided to pass the book. He says, it's, it's your conflict, take care. He simply tells her to do what she thinks is best. Now, at this point, don't you think Abram was you know, completely confused about God's promise? Where is this child going to come from that God promised him. He must have really wondered what to believe. Let's go back to Hagar and Sarah. Sarah mistreated Hagar. Could have been physical or verbal abuse. Hagar runs, goes, finds herself out in the desert. She's alone. She's pregnant. She's totally exhausted. And she came to a spring of water and sat down for a really good cry. And we can assume that Hagar knew something about Abram's God. She had probably heard about him. She wondered if God had totally forgotten her. She said, where is God now? Does he have any idea that the mess I'm in? How can I raise this baby by myself? I mean, she just felt totally forsaken by God. And then we come to verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her. See, God knew exactly where Hagar was. And he calls her by name. He knows her troubles. He knows about the child in her womb and knows what name that child will be given. And he tells Hagar about her future and says, The Lord has heard your cries. Now, I don't know if it's possible for us to grasp how revolutionary this dialogue was between Hagar and God. I mean, she knew God as being far away. In her culture, God was busy, preoccupied, indifferent. He was powerful, but not attentive. But Hagar now sees that this is wrong, that that wasn't God at all. And by calling God El Roi, the God who sees, she's screaming out to her culture, and she's screaming out to us, You have it all wrong. God is not tied up with global concerns. He's not far away. He's not asleep. He's not hard, angry, and severe. God is present. And he met me, me, he met with me where I was. And he knew exactly what I had been through. 
He did not miss a thing. The true God sees, says Hagar. And this theme of God who sees, everything is woven throughout the scripture. We see this point again and again that God sees. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Psalm 94, 9. Can't the maker of eyes see? Jeremiah 23, 23, 24. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret place? So I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth? 1 Peter 3, 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And then we have an interesting verse in Ezekiel 10, 9 through 12. We read the vision of Ezekiel. I look, and I saw beside the cherubim four wheels, one beside each of the cherubim. The wheels sparkle like crystal light. As for their appearance, of the four of them look alike. Each was like a wheel intersecting a wheel. And as they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the cherubim faced. The wheels did not turn about as the cherubim went. The cherubim went in whatever direction the head faced while turning as they went. Their entire bodies, including their backs, their hands, and their wings, were completely full of eyes, as were their four wheels. Now, I knew my mom had eyes in the back of her head. But this is totally ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, if someone had told you they had this vision, you would have thought maybe they had too much caffeine that morning. Or perhaps something else they had that morning. The wheels were full of eyes. And this tells us that the eyes of the Lord are every place. He is the sovereign God who pays attention. He doesn't miss the smallest detail. His eyes are everywhere. He has laser focus on you and me. Now, how do we respond to this truth about God? It's good. Is it, is it good and comforting to know that God sees everything? Or does it leave us with some negative emotions? How does it make you feel that God sees everything? Now, if I'm really honest, I have three responses to this elbow I, the God who sees. And this may surprise you, but the first one is anger. Because God can see everything, then that means he sees what's going on in the Middle East. He sees the aid orphans in Africa. He sees earthquakes and fires, and he sees the drunk drivers. He sees those who are unemployed and hungry. He sees people who are fighting sickness. He sees believers that are being killed for their faith. So the question becomes, if he sees all, why doesn't he intervene? Why don't you do something about this, God? If we thought he doesn't see it all, we could let him off the hook a bit. But the Bible says he sees it all. In a small group, there was a husband who had a wife that had been very painful and sickness, and there was no medical cure in the world. And the small group gathered around her and, and laid their hands upon her and prayed for her healing. And we've all done something similar to that. Sometimes God touches and cures the person, but sometimes he does not. And it's very difficult to put that together with a God who sees. So Yancey, in his book, Pre Reaching for the Invisible God, he said, how can I praise God for the good things in life? Without censoring him for the bad. I can do so only by establishing 
an attitude of trust. Paranoia and reversed, based on what I have learned in my relationship with God. And I have learned, as we mature in our faith, there will be times when we are angry at God, but this needs to be moved more and more to a place of trust. This is what I want to move toward. See, we need to learn how to believe the best about God. If he chooses not to answer my prayer in the way I want him to, what conclusions do I draw? I mean, do I decide, well, God must not be listening, he must not be loving, he, he really not, must not be aware? Or do I lean toward the mountain of evidence in Scripture and my own experience that tells me God is loving? He really must be aware. He has compassion and he hears my cry. And he will be with me no matter what, even in the darkness. Now, he didn't promise me that life would be easy. But he did promise that he would never, ever leave me. That he would hold my hand no matter how dark it was. And that's what I believe about God. Now, there's so much in this life that we do not understand. But remember, God is God, and I am not. God doesn't owe me an explanation of why he does what he does. I can pray to him about what I want to see done in this world, but then I must learn to trust him. Now, during many of his summer stock appearances in the role of Tel Aviv and Filler on the Roof, Robert Merrill had learned to expect the unexpected to happen on stage. He said, one night on stage, he said, as I was imploring God to give me a replacement for my horse, which had lost his shoe, suddenly a small spotted dog walked onto the stage. I looked up again and added fervently, oh God, please try again. <laughs> and, and we pray to God, and the answer comes, and we don't like it. And instead of trusting, we pray, oh God, please try again. <laughs> please try again. Now, whether you are a basketball fan or not, you are probably familiar with the name Larry Bird, the former great basketball player with the Boston Celtics. Now, during a retirement party, or Larry Bird in Boston Garden, former Celtics coach Casey Jones told of diagramming a play on the sidelines, going in great detail on how he wanted that play to run, with Bird just dismissing it, said, get the ball to me and get everybody out of my way. And Casey Jones said, I am the coach, and I will say what we're going to do. And he turned back to the players and said, give Bird the ball and everybody get out of his way. <laughs> And that's the message. Give the ball to Jesus. Put your life in his hands. Get out of the way. We need to give the God the ball. And to trust him. To trust him. Though Jesus on the cross modeled this for us. There were two statements he made. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then almost with the next breath, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We can come to God with our confusion. He can handle our confusion. He urges us then to move to a place of trust. He is the God who sees. And we can trust him. Now my second response to LOI is fear. God sees everything that includes everything about me. Hebrews 4.13 Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him 
to whom we give an account. The bottom line is, God sees everything. He sees our every thought, our attitudes, our slanderous words, small lies, big lies, our darkest moments. He sees everything. And in our culture, we have seen the horror of what someone thought was secret get brought into light. So many, year ago, many years ago, Martha Stewart was convicted because of a recorded telephone conversation she thought would never be played in a courtroom. A CEO of Tyco must have been horrified to see on national TV the videotape of a $2 million birthday party he threw for with his wife in Greece on company funds. See, one of these days, all our lives will be laid bare before God, our judge. Now, there's a song that we probably all sang when we were little. Now, we'll be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. I was tempted to have us rehearse this for special next week. Nice, I mean. Other verses may be careful, little mouths, what you say. Be careful, little hands, what you do. Be careful, little feet, where you go. And, you know, some may think that this song is teaching that God is some policeman in the sky writing down every time we do something wrong. And that's a horrible view of God. Notice the words right at the end. For the Father up above is looking down in love. God's warning about sin is his desire to see us protected from, from sin. He's saying, please don't, you know, please avoid that trap. It will lead to destruction. Don't say those words. They will be hurtful to that person. You will regret them. I urge you to choose to be pure. Don't give your sexuality away casually. Don't look at that type of material. Don't focus on that kind of movie. Don't go there because it won't be good for you. I'm looking down in love, and I have made something a whole lot better for you. Don't go that direction. At a Christian summer camp for children, one of the counselors was leading the discussion on the purpose of God and for everything that he created. And they came up with good reasons about, you know, clouds and trees and rocks and rivers and animals and about everything else in nature. Then one child said, why did God make poison ivy? And that stumped the counselor. He, uh, he, uh, you know, he didn't know what to say. And, and finally, one child bailed him out. She said, the reason God made poison ivy is because God wanted us to know there are certain things we needed to keep our cotton-picking hands off of. For our own good. God knows there are certain things we need to keep away from. We need to keep our cotton-picking hands off from. Don't go down that path. I have something better for you. And this leads me to the third response I have concerning El Roi. I, I feel secure and peaceful when I know that God sees me. God sees our past. He knows everything that has happened. He saw when you were alone and nobody cared. He saw when you were insulted or overlooked. He saw every unkind word spoken to us and when we were betrayed. He notices when we felt invisible to everyone else. He saw when we were unfairly treated. God celebrated the times you were kind. He has seen every minute that was in service to him. He has seen every check you wrote for the kingdom of God. He has heard every prayer that you have prayed for yourself and others. He knows what you are dealing with right now in your life. And, 
and God sees our future. God intends to be there when we go through all of it. Now, there's an old love song that states, I want someone watching over me. And that expresses a longing that we have, and we're created to know that there is a Heavenly Father up above watching over our lives. And, and Jesus said, even the hairs of our head are numbered. For me, he subtracts every day. But, you know, that's the way it is. But that's how much God thinks of you and me. Now, I'm really glad that I know of God to be big, powerful, and totally in control. But I'm also glad that he is close, personal, and attentive. Hagar got it right. He is the God who sees. And I hope you sense a tremendous amount of security and peace that God sees you. There are six billion people on this planet, and God knows your name. He knows how much you need him right now. I like the expression that says, if, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. I like that thought. I like that idea. God loves you with a relentless and outrageous personal kind of love. He's going to be with you when you lay down tonight and when you get up in the morning. I mean, do you grasp the wonder of this truth? It's almost impossible to get our arms around that God is loving and he's personal and intimate. But that's the way he is. And we need to sink and down to our soul this God who sees. There's a story of young Matthew Huffman that came across my desk. He was a six-year-old son of missionaries in Salvador, Brazil. And one morning he began to complain of a fever. And his temperature went up and he began to lose his sight. And his mom and dad put him in the car and raced him to the hospital. And as they were driving there, he would just take it, he would reach out with his hand. And his mom would draw it back in, but then he would reach back out with it again. And, and she would draw it back down again, and he would reach back out for it with it again. And she said, Matthew, what are you reaching for? He said, I'm reaching for the hand of Jesus. I'm reaching for the hand of Jesus. That was the last thing he said before he went to a coma. And a couple of days later, he died of bacterial meningitis. But of all the things he didn't learn, of all the things he did learn in his short life, he learned the most important. To reach out, reach up for the hand of Jesus in the hour of need. So my friends, let us reach out to the God who loves us with a relentless and outrageous person of love. We, we can reach out, we can reach out our hand to the God who sees. And he'll grab it. He'll grab it. Because of his outrageous love for us. Let's sing our last hymn. If for some reason you would like to come to the altar and pray, if you like God speaking to your heart, feel free to do so. And join us. Come thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing. Turn my heart to sing thy praise. Dreams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of Amen. 
you're there. If there's someone here this morning who's going through a great trial, we just pray that the thought that you are the God who sees and that you care and that you're there will help lift him up this morning. And I will just commit to you, come to you, lay it all on the altar and know that you hear. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 